want to say hello to everybody on Facebook again. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day that we worship God. So make sure everybody gathers around. Would you share it with folks that uh, maybe not have the uh, uh, a church family or maybe they're not streaming in their church? We want to thank you so much for joining us. Had a tremendous Sunday school lesson. It's going to work in right with the message this morning. I'm, I, I like that. That's uh, uh, Gary and I don't don't coordinate like that. Only the Holy Ghost can do that. And so uh, we want to sing the wondrous story. Do you remember when you got saved? Maybe through this song you'll you'll uh, ask the Lord to, and you'll say thank you, Lord. But we're going to stand and sing first, second, third, and last stanza of I'll sing the wondrous story two twenty eight. together. Uh, let's ask God to help us during this worship hour. It's going to be a good day. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and you said, if we ask anything in your name, according to our will, it'll be granted to us. And we pray that uh, the message, the songs, the, the fact that we're trying to give our life to thee would be effective in the hearts and minds of those that are listening. Pray that our minds would be fixated on you and that would be softened to allow the the scriptures to penetrate and to eradicate satanic activity. God, thank you for our church. Thank you for all the listeners and viewers. I do pray for one particular unspoken in my mind. I pray, God, you'll deal with that uh, particular person and help them. I know they're struggling. I ask you, Lord, that you would help those that are sick, uh, the coronavirus victims and the families that have lost loved ones through this time, our country, the finances that so many are uh, struggling with and our our businesses, I pray for our president, Lord, and the vice president, the task force, all those that are on the front lines, we pray for them today that they would be rejuvenated by the scriptures. I know, God, life comes from you, and if we would just uh, encourage those that uh, are working so hard and those that are at home to, to seek your face, I know, Lord, that they'll get life uh, and more abundant life. Thank you again for what you're going to do for us today and to us. Uh, Lord, would you soften us, mold us, and make us into thy image. We praise you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you're already standing. Let me just give you a couple announcements, a couple things that's going on. Uh, this past week, uh, Junior informed me that uh, the church, uh, the plumbing is about 99% done. They just got one, two little things, two little things I think he said, right, Junior, uh, to do. Uh, and le electrician uh, is about done, just got one, maybe one little thing to do. Uh, and so we got the cabinet, um, the, the stove hoods up and all that. And I think we've got to hang the other cabinet, right? Is that, is that, uh, and put the sink in and get, got to get countertops. And uh, that's just one of those processes. I hope you've enjoyed this crazy weather. One day is 75 degrees and the next day is 45. That's really, uh, a lady at the gas station told me, we were talking a little bit and she said, it's in scriptures, we won't know one season from the other. Uh, is what she said. And I said, well, that's, that's about all the time anymore. But uh, they always guessing at the weather. But uh, I'm glad that uh, we can come together on a 
Sunday morning and still uh, see each other, at least one side. I don't see you. I hope you're posting something and uh, putting some uh, comments in there so that we know that you're there. If you're visiting with us from another church, we, we, we're not trying to get you to join. We, we'd love for you to just comment so we know that you're part of participating in this. If God has helped you in any way uh, through any of the services or songs, we want to ask you to uh, make a comment there. That encourages folks to keep on keeping on for Jesus. This is a battle that we're in, and the battle is in, in mostly in our mind, and we want to... Uh, encourage folks as much as we possibly can. Uh, with that, I do want to say thank you again to June and Richard Williams uh, that uh, uh, did another floor and did the kitchen floor uh, in the church while we're out uh, uh, and did a fantastic job. We thank you. We're going to keep on using him. Amen. And Miss June, are fantastic workers and uh, uh, they're sweet folks. And we want to uh, say thank you to all the uh, our school teachers. Uh, all of our school parents that are uh, still getting their kids to do their work. And uh, this spring break's about over. We start again Monday. In the same way we are enrolling, if you want to enroll your child in our uh, Christian school, we can do that. You can get online and go to the uh, uh, the site there, mybiblebaptist.com. All right, well, that's enough of me yakking around. Uh, oh, let me say one more thing. If uh, you don't uh, regularly listen to uh, our radio station, uh, you can go to website, and there's a link to that. It's Rushing Wind Radio on TuneIn Network. Or you can say, Alexa, TuneIn, Rushing Wind Radio, and she'll put you there. I've tried it at home, and it works good, Richard. Thank you. There's people listening all over the world and watching, and we want to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, we're going we're gonna to sing again, and uh, uh, we don't take up an offering like that. I do appreciate everybody gives, uh, but after usually that second song, we take up an offering. Uh, and we want you to make sure that you're still giving like you're supposed to. Not because you have to, but because you're supposed to. Uh, you, you want to. You want to give. You want to give as unto the Lord. So it's all. we're going to sing all four stanzas of 103 in your red book. More about Jesus. More about Jesus. I was thinking these last couple of days looking at the flowers. Uh, we had what I thought was a juga in our yard growing with the juga as kind of a, a, a ground cover. But it turned out it is not a juga. It, it, it's kind of a weed. And, and uh, it started, the leaves started changing. 
And then this beautiful, beautiful sprout of blue flowers came up. You've seen them less. Because I hadn't, that's the only thing that's high in the yard is these little blue, blue flowers. And the reason why I know they're kind of like weeds or, I mean, all flowers were weeds at one sense. That's something they cultivated them. But, uh, but they're all over the side of the road. And I, I, this is the thought that goes to my mind. In the midst of, notice the birds, and I think you alluded to it, Brother Gary, the birds and the, the bees and the flowers and the trees and all that. Uh, they're, not, they're not getting succumbed to the worries and, and frustrations of the times. They're still blooming. They're still singing. Uh, they're still buzzing. They're still making uh, honey and, and, and all that. I, I got tickled uh, the other last week. I hadn't looked at them this week. Uh, but I've got a blackberry bush, and I may have told you this already. I went out there, and it is covered in blackberries. And they're just little teeny blackberries. This, uh, they're going to be good in a, in a few months, I guess, towards maybe August or July. Uh, but uh, they're still doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, they don't have a brain. And maybe that's their benefit, right? <laughs> I guess the birds do, and maybe the bees, but uh, the plants don't. They just, they do what God's told them to do, and I hope that we'll learn to do that as well. It's kind of uh, something we have to, we have to uh, be conformed, to, not conformed to this world, but transformed by renewing of our mind. Gary's going to sing for our preach, and, and uh, may the Lord bless My Savior left his royal throne He could not claim a country for his own He put on flesh, became a man One day he would fulfill Redemption's plan. I stand amazed. I stand in awe. I can't believe that Jesus paid it all. He came to earth to die in my place. I praise the Lord for his amazing grace. My Savior died that I might live. He paid the price, my sins he did forgive. They nailed him on that rugged tree. One day I'll live with him eternally. I stand amazed, I stand in awe. I can't believe that Jesus paid it all. He came to earth to die in my place. I praise the Lord for his amazing grace. Now Jesus reigns as Lord all at his dear feet one day i'll humbly fall but until then i'll sing his praise i'll serve the lord of lords through all my days i stand amazed i stand in awe i can't believe that Jesus paid it all. He came to earth to die in my place. I praise the Lord for his amazing grace. I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for his amazing grace. Time for another song. Amen. You want to sing? You said you'd sing. Go ahead. She looked at me like a deer in headlights. She's like, but she, she, she's going to sing. I, yeah, don't you want her to sing? Say amen. 
uh, let her sing and appreciate that amazing grace. Gary's got that on CD, so if you don't have Gary's CD, I reckon you still got a few copies, don't you, bro? And uh, you can get that. And uh, uh, let's worship the Lord today. Let's honor Him uh, with more than just our lips, with uh, praising Him and loving Him. He's worthy to be praised. He's, uh, he's worthy to be honored. I believe God loves it when we say, I magnify you, I exalt you, I, I, I raise you up in my life. Lord, you're my all in all. You're my love of, you're my savior. You're my friend. I believe God really loves that. He wants us to uh, say these things and, and mean them from our heart. And uh, as we prepare for the message, here we go. that song. I hadn't heard it in a while. Uh, I heard a, a preacher say, I think he, he had come to, to our church, uh, it's been years ago, but he made a statement that at the time it raised my eyebrows, <clears throat> and he says there's, uh, you can preach on soul winning too much. 
uh, you can um, preach on certain things too much. There has to be a balance. Uh, and with that song and what Brother Gary was saying, I think that uh, what I'm going to preach and what Brother Gary taught this morning, I think what's uh, important to understand is the battle that we're in that's in the mind, uh, the devil don't, doesn't care how he wins it. He can, it, it. he can win it through sinful activity and distracting us and beguiling us through, with sin, he will. But he can also take our mind to places that would seem to be scriptural, seem to be spiritual, like, you know, over, like I'm going to go soul winning 12 hours a day, but you don't worship him. You worship the fact that what you're doing, or I'm going to give this, and you know, I'm a good Christian because I give, and, and then the devil gets you that way as well. And uh, so the first and foremost thing that we're supposed to do, bar none, is to worship him. It is... Uh, it is what we're supposed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. We are supposed to do that first and foremost. All those other things uh, are necessary. They're a part of our, our, our love for God, but to worship Him in spirit and truth, to praise Him. And I've talked about this many times. Praising God is outward forms of emotional you can hands, shout, uh, amen, nod your head, stand up. Some of you run, some of you skip, hop, whatever you want to do. But worship is surrender. Worship is giving thy life to the Lord. Uh, but the devil loves to play mind games. And I don't know if you've been struggling in the last few weeks, uh, uh, but I know I have. I've had ups and downs and stuff, and there's been a real battle. The battle hasn't been in my flesh necessarily. The byproduct of the battle in the mind is how the flesh reacts. So let me give you an example. Is if uh, the, the, the devil will tell you, you need, you need carbs, you need carbs. And then you need to eat this, eat that, and then you go out and you go eat your whole bag of chips. You're, <laughs> the battle in the mind was lost, and you fulfilled that losing of it in uh, the flesh. But uh, in times like these, we're all experiencing satanic activity to some level. Uh, he loves to play mind games. I don't know if you like mind games. Uh, Keely, this past week or last week, uh, she she came to me. Uh, we were at my mom's, and, and she said, "Dad, figure this out. It's a puzzle. It's a mind game." And uh, she put a bunch of pennies on the table and she formed a, a triangle. And she said, with just three moves, can you change the direction of the triangle? And uh, it's kind of hard to explain in just talking about it. But uh, the, the, the thing that your, your mind wanted to do is move four. But you, you can't do that. It's playing mind games. But there was a way of fulfilling that. Uh, that mind game, that, that it wasn't a trick. It was just you had to think things through. You had to be slow. You had to uh, slow to wrath, so to speak. Sometimes you just want to throw some of them games out the door. Some of y'all like those uh, mind uh, those, those puzzles that impossible to get uh, figure out. Ru Rubik's Cube people, God bless you. You're special, I tell you. I have learned that the, the way you solve a Rubik's Cube is you give it to Junior over there. Amen? No, you, there is a certain pattern. You just repeat that pattern and it'll eventually get back. But I've seen those Rubik's Cubes where there's uh, normally nine, 12, maybe 10 or 12 you know, cubes and there's maybe, maybe 50 or something, little tiny things. But mind games, mind games. We've got to keep our mind strong. We know that. We've got to keep our mind on the offense uh, and, and we have to use defense at times as well. Uh, it, it is the devil's purpose and sole goal to damn as many souls in hell as he possibly can. And he'll do that first and foremost through your mind. He, he'll, he'll whisper, he'll talk to you, he'll, he'll reveal some things to you. And if you're not careful, you'll take the bait and you'll run with it and as the old fishing analogy, you'll swallow the hook, and once you swallow that hook, you're done for. It don't matter if you're too little, too big, too skinny, too fat, you're going to die. He also seeks to make the life of the Christian as miserable as possible as we let him ruin our day 
or walk or with or ruin our day, ruin our walk with God, and even ruin our testimony. What do you think the devil's actively doing? The demons in our life, he's trying to mess with your mind. Some of y'all are uh, having difficulties today because the devil has messed with your mind. The devil's playing with your mind. He's making you think one thing. Uh, he's making you assume things. He's making you uh, put words in people's mouths or, or put intent in people's mouth, uh, motives in, in, in scenarios. And you think God, I, I've talked with somebody recently, they think God doesn't love them because their life isn't perfect. And it's like, are you kidding me? God loves us even though our life isn't perfect. Our life is going to be perfected. We find that this battle first takes place with our five senses. On the outside, the devil uses our eyes, our ears, our taste, our touch, our smell to infect our mind. And through these different temptations, and I, I mean, I could go through all the different types of sins and sensual sins and lustful, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but I'll just go through a few of them. Uh, the, through temptations and trials, our own lusts and desires uh, are the seeds of this war. And the devil plants them in our minds. And I don't know about this, I don't know about you, but uh, there's a lot of things in school and in college that I can't remember for the life of me. But boy, if you said something against me, or if you, if you did something, or if somebody had all against you, you ain't ever going to forget that. And amazing how the devil can plant that seed and absolutely grow a huge, uh, what is it called when you enclose the garden terrarium or whatever, <laughs> within that brain of yours. Our war starts in the flesh, but the battle is in our mind. Satan takes anything he can and exaggerates it. Understand this. He takes anything he can to exaggerate. If you've been married for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. Say amen, hallelujah. It could be one little word or the fact they didn't say one word or you didn't do one little thing. And all of a sudden, it blows up and exaggerated and he exaggerates it. Whether it makes it big or small, He's doing all he can to damn souls to hell and to ruin the Christian testimony in their walk with God. We cannot defeat Satan through fist fighting, although it would be good to give, give him a black eye. Amen? Uh, or carnal weapons. It would be nice to pull out your RA-15, is that right? Or one of those machine guns or your Glock and blow his brains out. It would be alright to do that. Uh, but, we, but this battle, this war isn't fought with carnal weapons. This battle is a spiritual battle. It's a battle that's in the mind. Uh, Satan's abilities to create anxiety, depression, greed, laziness, uh, turn doers of the Word into just dreamers. Of the word. You know, people that dream, they talk about everything they want to do, but they never do anything to fulfill it. In the mind, he takes our thoughts and develops them in. To actions. If you give him an inch, he becomes a ruler. Uh, one man said, You will act like the sort of person you conceive yourself to be. So some of you young people listening today, uh, you may have had a bad go about a few few weeks, months, or years where you didn't do all the right things and, and your parents or grandparents said, you're, just, you're rotten to the core. And you take that and you start telling yourself uh, that. You just start telling yourself that and then you become that for life. You lost the battle. But you don't have to. You don't have to lose the battle. You don't have to lose the war. The Apostle Paul addresses us, addresses us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would turn there in your Bible, how to defeat Satan in our minds. It's that battle in our brain. It's that battle between that thick skull of ours that we need to defeat Satan, and we can. He wins. The devil wins our hearts. If he wins our heart, he affects our heart, we're going to lose our minds. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And he, boy, he enters in our senses, our eyes, our ears, our, our mouth, our nose, our, our, our touch. And he enters our heart and, boy, he corrupts that. Then he'll corrupt your mind. And then if you don't, you're not careful, you're going to lose the battle in the brain. The 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, if you can stand, let's reverence the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says this. He says, For though we walk in the flesh... 
We do not war after the flesh. So that's what he's talking about. We don't, we don't use fists and guns. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So the devil wants to get a stronghold in your brain. He gets a stronghold in your brain, that means he's got your heart. That means he's got your footsteps. That means he's got what you're going to conceive yourself to be. Verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? Question mark. It's a very important statement. If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. Apostle Paul writing a very, very... Uh, difficult church, church in a difficult time. They were struggling, the Corinthian church, much like today. I, I've said this about the church of today. It's Laodicean age, we know in Revelation chapter 4, uh, but, but it's also Corinthian style church, very carnal and very not winning the battles. We're, we're, we, we claim the blood, we, we praise God and worship and sing the praises, but we live our life in doom and gloom and the devil's beating the snot out of us in our minds. We can put on the little fa fancy smiles and, hey, how are you? How are you? And knowing inside that the devil has rule. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the privilege to preach. And I pray the devil get a black eye. I pray, Lord, you bind him. I pray, Lord, there'll be revenge set forth and we push him in the place he needs to be. Pull down them strongholds tonight, today. God, help us, I pray. Fill me. Speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's interesting that this book, written to the church of Corinth, Paul also wrote to the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, he writes in chapter number 6, if you like to turn there, he gives uh, basically what we need to do in order to fight this battle. In uh, 2 Corinthians, he tells us it is not a physical battle. So we know that through his terminology and what he's saying in 2 Corinthians, uh, that what he's giving us in chapter 6 of Ephesians, which is the whole armor of God, is not a physical fleshly armor, but it's an armor that is put on within our mind, within our spirit. Chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His, of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now understand, devil, the wiles of the devil is just anything he can ever think of. He can come to you as an angel of light to deceive the very elect if it were possible. Most people don't understand satanic activity because they live in it so often. They don't understand that it's the devil. They, they want to blame the church. They want to blame God's people. They want to blame those that are representing Christ when the devil as an angel of light, is there to deceive. He goes on and he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, your, and having your, on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the, prepara with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here we realize that defeating Satan in our mind, God gives us a set of weapons that we can, we can obtain and use within our mind. And, and I'm going to describe three of these weapons in particular. And I hope these, this message will help you. To control your life means to control your mind. 
the reason why there's so much depression and anxiety and rampant sin, addictions that we can't overcome and we can't change who we are. We say, well, this is the way I was raised. We use all the sorts of excuses. I'm old. I'm young. I'm not smart. I'm this. It's because the devil has messed with your mind and you believe the lie of the devil. The devil's a liar. He, he is the father of all lies. And if you will allow him to control your mind, he will control your life. And when it's, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't achieve. There's so many people today, they say, I can't go back to school, but yet they go to school listening to the news. Brother Gary, you're talking about that today. Uh, that we go to school, we learn uh, new, uh, uh, new guns and new boating tricks and new, uh, new shopping techniques and, and scrapbooking and, and couponing and all that. We learn what we want to learn, but when the devil comes in and says, oh no, you're too old for that. Someone was telling me uh, uh, this in the past that they were trying to get their neighbor to start a Bible study and she said, I'm too old. But yet she spends all her days in the garden learning flowers and how to plant them and, and how to water them and how to do all. Do you know why we can often do those things and not do the spiritual things? Is because of those things you say, I don't have to think about because the devil has duped you so much has deceived you. He has more subtle than any other creature. And he's, he's played that war in your mind. He's made the war uh, just a little patty cake game. And you've given up and you've given in. You don't want to fight. You, you, don't wanna, you give up. And then you give in. And then nobody wins. And your testimony's shot. People think you're a nut job. Has anybody said you're nuts? You know why that is? If you're up and down like this all the time, all the time, all the time, it's because the devil is beating the snot out of you in your mind and you've got to take the whole armor of God and especially these three different weapons to, to defend yourself. The armor might offend somebody too, Brother Gary. I don't know. <laughs> the armor is essential for war. But I see three parts that, we, uh, that are essential that we can put on mentally. The first one is the most important to defeat Satan in our mind. And that's the sword of the Spirit. In verse 4 it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6 is the Word of God. And the only thing that's going to cut down uh, the devil and cut down us, our pride, our arrogancy, is the word of, word of God. It's the sword of Word of God that as we pick up and yield that, uh, well, yield that, uh, that sword of the Word of God in our brain, that's the only thing that's going to cut down uh, the pride. It's going to cut down Satan's activity in your mind. I want you to think about how little you're really using the sword of truth. The sword of spirit. How little we use it and why our minds are being overcome. You know how I can tell if you're, if you're not well, welding? Is that the right word? How to say? Uh, you're not swinging that sword of the spirit around? It's because if you were, the word of God would have preeminence. If you were, you would be quoting scripture to defend yourself. If you were, uh, you would be humble. And now, uh, but you're arrogant and you don't understand. And, and I'm this way and I can't help it. And you make excuses and you, you complain and whine to God and God says you can win the battle you can defeat the devil uh, through the sword of the spirit use the word of truth and cut that old devil down to size and cut your pride uh, down to where it should be and that should be zero swing the word of God to cast down the imaginations uh, that exalt themselves above God above his truth and above who he is fleshly thoughts become strongholds, uh, become addictions, become bitterness, hatred, jealousy, envy. I want to tell you something, church. The worst addictions in our church isn't dope. The worst, worst addiction in our church is bitterness and envy and strife and hatred and unforgiveness. That's the addiction, the devil. If you don't pick up the sword of the Spirit and, and knock the devil down, casting down the, every imagination that exalted itself above the knowledge of God. It's God's Word. God's no, the knowledge of who He is uh, that allows us to win the battle. It's not what we can do. Uh, we can just start coming to church. You know why extra Bible studies don't work? You, you know why extra Bible reading don't work when you're just saying, well, I'll just read. I'll just pray. I'll just do these things because you're not, you're just, you're, you're, you're putting the tools around you but you're not picking them up and using them. You've got to verbally rebuke the devil. 
He can't read your mind, although the battle's in the mind. He can't read your mind. The sword of the Spirit can keep us humble. I don't know about you, but have you ever sat in Sunday school and preaching and the Word of God humble you? When was the last time you said, Dear God, that's me. Whew. Lord, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. I realize it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Uh, kneeling in the in need of prayer should be. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. This is that humble place. And took up the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So think about if we're going to be victorious in our battle, in our mind, then we have to pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And as Christ humbled Himself, we follow in like manner. We humble ourselves through the Word of God. It's through the faith of the Word of God. And by the way, everything comes back to faith. If Satan can get you to imagine that sin is fun or everybody else is guilty, uh, he can get you to imagine that there's really not any consequences. There's no real consequences to my sin. If he can get you to rebel against the truths of God, guess what he's going to do? He's going to win. Have you ever, and I know we just, of course, few people here this morning, but maybe you can put it on Facebook. Do you know people? You can say, yes, I know people that they were in church and, and all of a sudden their attitude shifted and, and it was never dealt with and now they just purity hate God. Or, or they got some whacked out beliefs now. Uh, they listen to the internet. They think the world's flat. <laughs> because the, the devil is one way. They think that because God made every herb of the field that we can smoke every herb. I don't know about you, but I don't want to smoke anything. Amen? I don't, I don't like to go out inside and, and, and strike a fire and burn trash and inhale that. I don't want to burn a log and inhale that smoke, much less anything else. Think about how the devil has worked in your mind, has justified your sin, has justified your actions, and has ruined your testimony, has hurt you, has caused depression to be on the forefront of your mind, anxiety, up and down, 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 and you're, you're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And then you end up with pleasure, and you say, i got to have some relief, and so now I'm going to go shop. No, we can't do that much now. Walmart's packed out, but you can't go to... Uh, I about said roses. Ain't no roses, but what we doing about? You can't go to Belk's. But you, you, you go eat. You go do, you do other things. You, go, you try some other sin. I've known people that were in church for years. They had give up alcohol and smoking and, and all the lascivious living. But then the devil get in their mind and they fail to pick up that sword of the Spirit. You know, and cast down and knock down every imagination that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. That's our imagination. We imagine. We imagine well, this sin is this sin isn't that bad. God made that plant. Oh, God made food. Oh, yeah, I can do this. And I know some churches out there that are homosexual, so it's okay to be homosexual. Oh, it's okay. I know preachers that are shacked up, so it's okay for me to shack up. It exalted itself against every knowledge of God. But what is the main thing that exalted this? All those little sins that are petty compared to pride. And here I, I know that I deal with it oftentimes when we say, I, I'm just, I don't want to hear it. Ugh, good man. I don't want to deal with it. You know, it's better not to deal with it, isn't it? It's better not to deal with it. Just let it be, just let it fester. Let the war rage. As long as we let people control us, people will control us. And as long as we let the devil control our mind, he will control our mind. Defeating Satan mentally, you must put on not only uh, take the, shield, the, uh, the sword of, the, of spirit, but you take the shield of faith. The shield of faith is not just for repelling Satan's darts, but verse 5, it says this, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience 
when your obedience is fulfilled. So the shield of faith is used to corral. This is what I want you to think in your mind. you got all those thoughts that are disobe- disobedient thoughts. And I don't you be Mr. Spiritual, Mrs. Spiritual. Now, you have disobedience thoughts. Some of you have already thought about turning you off and, and clicking over to some old uh, uh, happy-go-lucky preacher who ain't going to tell you you're in sin. And so, so the, the, the idea is taking the sword of the truth. And this is a, a terrible example here, but uh, corralling. You got the, the, um, the shield of faith. You got, you're corralling uh, those thoughts of disobedience. You're pushing them down. It's not, just for blocking the, it's not just for blocking the darts. The devil will attack you from afar off. But then the thoughts will come in your mind. And, and then you start entertaining those thoughts and, and, and the, those disobedient thoughts that I don't need to go to church, don't need to uh, go to Sunday school, don't need to give, don't need a witness, don't need to... Disobedient thoughts. I don't need to forgive. I don't need to listen. I don't need to grow. And this shield of faith, just like the sword of the Spirit, is, is to push, push, push those, those horrible disobedient thoughts. Push them down. Push them away so the obedience of Christ can come and take hold. The shield of faith is to bring every captivity into thought, every thought of, into captivity. Make sure that it's the right kind of thought. Weak faith allows Satan to sow doubt and fear. Our faith comes from the Word of God. And that's what builds our shield. Notice the sword of the the Spirit is the Word of God. And faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God is faith. Now we have the shield of faith. It's built by the Word of God. And that's what we bring in a captive. You know, here's a scenario is that uh, no doubt that some of y'all are Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Negative. Uh, everything's negative. Everything's you, you see, you, you think everybody's got a bad motive. It doesn't matter what they're doing, whether it's the president or Pastor Chris, anything I say or do, oh, there's a bad motive in it. And you come in and, you're, and you think, you say, well, this is the way I've always been. And I know, I can tell. Amen. But when you take the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, you know what you're doing? You, when, you, when you come in and you see someone or you're, uh, or you're talking to somebody and those thoughts of disobedience, those imaginations, those false thoughts of imagination that exalt itself above the knowledge of God and those uh, disobedient actions and thoughts, you take the sword of the Spirit and you slay them, you knock them down and you take the shield of faith and you push them down and you put them in subjection, into captivity. So I'm not going to give place to the devil. I'm not going to let him win. You know, we can think bad about everybody because there's bad in everybody. Or I can be free and win the battle, win the war by using the shield of faith, using the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and bring into captivity and slay, pulling down the strongholds that are in our mind. You allow, you allow the devil to take a foot and he's going to be the leader. He is going to be the ruler of your life. Some of you are struggling today. Your weak faith shows it. There are some that realize uh, uh, that there are battles with Satan and he uses weapon, and they use their, the weapons that God has afforded against them. But then there are others that don't have much of a sword or a shield. And those would be, honestly, usually the young Christians that are learning to develop those, those weapons and understand what they are. But then you have folks that have been saved for a long time and you're wondering why you're getting beat up. I, I don't know why. Let me just say, it's easier to say this is an empty congregation. I don't know why people that are weak in the faith want to brag how long they've been saved. And they don't want to admit that they didn't get saved at eight years old and live like the devil for 50 years. They really just got saved. And say, you know what, I'm going to humble myself and realize that that profession that I made at a, at a child's age that didn't do a thing for me, didn't change anything in my life, it didn't put me in church, it just put God on my mind. And the devil don't mind if God's on your mind as long as God don't have control of your mind. And then you're an older person, you finally, your life changes, you get back in and you're struggling, you say, well, but I've been saved for 35 years. I wouldn't brag on that. And that's pride too. I'm not where I need to be because the devil is beating the snot out of me. He's killing me. The shield of faith is used to crush 
the disobedience, to bring it into captivity. Within our minds, we must be ready to use these weapons. Some people are pacifists. They're, they're not fighters. Some people say, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Well, that's fine for the brethren, but it better not be for the devil. You better, you better pick up that sword. You better pick up that shield. And that's all you really got to do. It's not really uh, laboring heavy to defeat him. But the devil, when he sees that you're holding that shield of faith, holding that shield of the Spirit, and holding that sword of the Spirit, he'll understand that I better let him go. I better let him alone right now. I'll wait till he lays it down after church. He'll lay it down. She'll lay it down after church. On Monday, they'll lay it down and they won't pick it back up and I'll get them then. I'll get them mad at their boss. I'll get them mad at their kids. I'll get them mad at their spouse. I'll, I'll make them think imaginary things that they're cheating on me or, or they don't really love me or, or, or God's going to, or has forsaken them. And I'm going to make them think all sorts of things and, and then they're going to be disobedient and I'm going to make them be more disobedient and they're not going to pick up the shield of faith and they're not going to pick up the sword of the Spirit. I'm going to, I'm going to rule their mind. And destroy their testimony. First Peter 1.13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. You know the loins of your mind? You know why it says the loins of your mind? The loins on anything is the most tender spot. It's delicate. It's within the loins that reproduction is made too. It's from the loins. He says, gird them up. Protect them. Protect them. Be sober. And the hope uh, to the end for the grace that is, brought, uh, that is to be brought uh, unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Look at that, ignorance. But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. But it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Satan is trying to get you to be disobedient. Just in a small thing. It doesn't really matter. Sure, we all do fall short. I'm not advocating that we're going to all of a sudden uh, do it all perfectly. It's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you're not even trying, if you're not even trying, we're going to fail. We're, we're, we're going to make mistakes. It's where we admit those and we don't let that, that pride to build up in the thought that, well, everybody else makes mistakes, so I don't need to confess it. That's the imagination, buddy. That's where you're, woohoo. The devil's got a hold of your brain. Have you ever talked to people and they start talking about their life and the justification of their life? Well, you just don't know. I understand you may not have had a good uh, upbringing. I understand a mom and daddy may not have been there. I understand you may have been abused. You're going to use that the rest of your life? And neglect the weapons of your warfare? And let the devil beat the snot out of you the rest of your days? That's foolish. When God says, here I've got for you an armor. I've got something that's going to help you. 1 Peter 4.1 says, For as much as, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. we got to at some time acknowledge and say, I'm going to shift. I'm going to do my best. It may be a baby step. And I'm going to applaud you if you just give it a try. Uh, you may not be able to walk the first time. The, the shield may be a little heavy. Uh, the sword may be too hard to wield. Uh, but at least you try a little bit. And how do we know you're trying? Is your mind starts to level off. Uh, and you start thinking good things. Uh, you start loving people. You start forgiving. You, you don't have envy and, and, and murders in your heart. You don't have strife and bitterness. Because you've got you got God directing that brain of ours. I can tell you this, as I've grown a little bit, and I've still got a whole lot of growing to do, I have, I believe I've prevented a whole lot of fights because when people say things or do things, and they may have meant evil. They may be trying to just get under my skin. They may do it on purpose. But God the Holy Ghost is say. They just don't know no better. Take that shield. You take that sword. 
And you bring it, you knock it down, you pull down them strongholds, you bring all the, the thoughts into captivity, the disobedient thoughts, and the revenge is there. Hey, I'm not going to let you dominate, and, and I'm not going to let you dictate to me how I'm going to respond. You may have meant evil for me, but God meant it for good. Defeating Satan mentally, we use this last, this last thing. It's interesting, these all three point to faith. The helmet of salvation. Notice these things are for protection. You say the sword can, you know, you can swing that, sure. But the devil usually doesn't get too close. He'll, he'll come from afar off and he'll, he'll just make fun of you. He'll go, like, like Goliath, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. He'll just make fun of you. He'll make you feel insecure. He'll make you feel inadequate. And you know, when you feel inadequate and insecure, a lot of times there's some pride issue there because you're actually wanting to be better than you are. So you ought not look at your, if you think you're not pretty, you think you're not just like every man thinks, that's the sin of saying God didn't, I don't believe God made something fearfully, wonderfully. I, I believe God, there's a sin there. We're always trying to be something else. That's the, your imagination. Come on, wake up, folks. Your imagination is working overload. He's playing mind games with you. Here the helmet of salvation is important. You know why? Because it protects what's inside. <laughs> it protects. Some of you may proclaim that I ain't got much there and I'll have to say amen and amen. See, if you were here, you'd laugh a little bit. But God still wants you to protect it. No matter if your brain's the size of your head or if it's just a pea inside that big noggin, God still wants you to put on the helmet of salvation. Satan will try to get inside your head and make you doubt your salvation. You see, the helmet of salvation is to protect how your mind processes faith. The shield of faith is to bring into captivity and to, the, the sword of the Spirit is to pull down those strongholds. The helmet is to hold inside the fact that let God be true and every man a liar. Use the helmet to look within. What God's done inside, outside will always have struggles. Listen to me. I don't care how spiritual you get. I don't how, can't care how eloquent you get, how, how much scripture you may be able to quote, how good you can tie a necktie or how good you look in a dress, how good your bouffant looks or you get your makeup right or everybody oohs and ahs at your ability to quote scripture. You're going to always have struggle in the flesh. This flesh will never be perfect until God changes it in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Hey, God says look within. Look within with what I got you. You know what I see here in verse number 7? Do you look on things after the outward appearance? <laughs> That's an interesting statement within this context, isn't it? And I, I never quite grasped it until I studied this thing out. Paul says, are you, are you someone that always looking on the outside? Always looking on the outside. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, the outside, look what I'm doing let him of himself think this thing, this again. And that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for, for edification, that's of course edification of others, and not for your destruction, he's trying to encourage you not to look on the outside, I should not be ashamed. What we look at has to be controlled and brought into obedience. Our mind needs to be weapon strong. I was told that the governor of Virginia is trying to disarm the residents doing something about the Second Amendment. I can tell you that that is something we should be concerned about. But what's more concerning is this right here. We've laid down our arms against the devil. We just said, I, I give up. If I'm saved, I'm saved. Oh, well, I can't know. I don't understand. I, I just don't because you don't want to try no more. You don't want to put on that helmet. The helmet off, oftentimes is not very comfortable. It really isn't. Helmet of salvation is there to protect the noggin, protect your mind, but it isn't there to make sure you have a, you have a spa in your brain. 
Because once we get too comfortable, listen to me, once you get too comfortable, you take for granted everything God's done for you. But often people say, oh, boy, it's just a little too rough for me. I just, yeah, I'm just going to give up. I'm telling you, every time I go to church and somebody says something ugly and that preacher keeps on yelling at me. Yeah, you go to the bars and the drug houses and they're shooting people, killing people. Then you go to Walmart. You, man, you have a fist fight in Walmart. Here God's trying to speak to you in your mind, but the devil has won the victory. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There's something that has to be done every day. Every day we have to continually put it on and pick it up. Put it on and pick it up. Put on the whole armor. Romans 12, 2, and it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may able uh, may uh, prove what that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The armor covers the areas that the devil attacks so, so specifically when it deals with the mind. Then there's two other pieces that I'm just briefly going to make a statement. Why didn't I use this? Well, because Paul in, in 2 Corinthians didn't mention something that would loop that. And I believe because uh, the, it says, have your loins covered with truth uh, and your feet shod with the preparation. Those are outward things. Those are soul ones. The, it's not negotiable, but the most important thing in the battle, the most important thing is, is, is this brain. So I could preach another message on uh, the loins girt with truth because that is uh, uh, preaching the gospel. That is understanding the gospel. That's the tender areas. That's what we understand. It's your lower section. You girt with truth. You don't let the devil deceive you. And then the, your feet shod with the preparation of peace, gospel of peace is you're telling people about Christ again. It's soul winning. It's telling people about Christ. The others are about you defending yourself from the devil. And these two are about telling people about the Lord Jesus. It's a mind thing. It's a mind thing. And I'll close this. In, in uh, my early years of pastoring, I used to really, really get on music with our teenagers and parents. And, and uh, the devil uses music in a big way to destroy our children. It's bridges into uh, worldliness and carnality and, and uh, self-expression. And even the contemporary Christian music, a lot of it is just fleshly motivated and it makes us take our, it makes us want to dance and throw up around and, and sway and all that kind of stuff. It makes you want to lay down the armor in our minds. We want to be amused through music. We want it to be Disneyland. Where amusement means all means no and muse means think. He, the devil don't want you to think. He wants to think for you. Hadn't you ever heard the old saying, the old, old timers used to say, that's the devil talking. Or they'd say, that's aunt so-and-so talking. That's your mama talking for you. Think for yourself. They'd say things like that. But friend, what about God? When is God going to speak for you? When, when is that word that's coming out of your mouth going to be generated in your brain and it's going to be God's word? The Bible says this, <coughs> that we must train our minds to think right. And so Paul says to the Philippian church, in chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You can't watch a nasty television program or horror movies and gut them up and shoot them up and think on these things. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind, one man said. Defeat Satan in the mind. If you don't, we're all going to be able to tell. You say, Satan's got a hold of you, man. Satan's got a hold of you, lady. And God doesn't want us to be defeated by Satan. We're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We're overcomers. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Would you take up that sword of the Spirit, which is, which is truth, which is the Word of God? And would you take up that shield of faith and bring everything into captivity? Would you put on that helmet of salvation? 
so that you can, when the devil's beating your brains out, it ain't going to hurt as you got the helmet of salvation on. Church, if you're listening, listening well today, and you're being beat up, why don't you bow your head right now and pray and ask God to help you put on these armors. And God will help you. Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes and say, Dear God, I know I've, I've allowed the devil to control my mind. I've, I've allowed impure thoughts, wicked thoughts, uh, ungodly thoughts to control me. And I need, I need to pick up the sword. I need to pick up the shield. I need to put on the, uh, on the helmet. And maybe, maybe today you'd say, Preacher Chris, oh man, I've, the devil's been, been tearing me up. But I don't know if I'm truly saved. I don't know if I've ever really been saved. I prayed a prayer one time and nothing really happened. Well, I can tell you what you can do. You can humble yourself right now in the sight of God and call out to Him and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. Would you please save me? Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Would you call out and ask Him? Would you just talk to Him? He's a God that wants to listen. He's an ever-present help in time of need. Why won't you call on Him, Christian? Why won't you call on Him, sinner? I'm going to tell you why if you don't. It's because you like where you're at. It's unfortunate. But a lot of people like to play the defeated person. And that's pride. That's pride. It's called indirect pride or reverse pride. I just want to be pitied. I just want all oh, poor pitiful them. And God says we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And we need to take up that armor He's given us and take those weapons and use them to guard our mind. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You for the privilege to be able to preach. I pray, Lord, You'll take the message and drive it deep into our hearts and into our minds that we would learn to use the weapons that we have to defeat Satan in our mind. God, forgive me of all the areas that I've fallen short. Help me to do better each and every day. Help me to put on the helmet. Help me to take up the shield. Help me take the sword. And then also gird my loins with truth and my feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace so others can hear that Jesus Christ saves. Lord, we thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. And I hope you'll join us tonight at 6 o'clock via radio or Facebook. If you have any questions, you can call me at 910-471-7822. You can post something on Facebook. It'd be great. Would you please share? I, I appreciate it. God bless you. Have a great day.